All right. Hello, everyone, again. Welcome again to another series of Friends webinars we have going on for today. Uh, just before we get started, could someone please confirm that in the, in the chat that we're actually, you're receiving something, something that I'm, I'm, I'm talking that, that, that the, uh, the voice is coming through. That would be perfect. All right, perfect. Uh, all right, great. So, uh, like I said, welcome to the to the next stage series in the in the French webinar here. And today we're going to be looking at uh, basically uh, a little bit of an architectural approach to building front end systems and basically more mobile applications. Any sort of a kind of an end user experience on top of French uh, APIs and how the integration between various different uh, end user end user appliances or applications uh, actually works with the with the friends apis and what sort of uh, options we have available for us there when we're developing the apis how we're connecting them to the backend systems although we'll spend a little less less time on on that front today as we are more focusing on the or more focused on the actual apis and, and how we are publishing them uh, we'll be looking at through an example application in uh, vue.js that I've created for us uh, to kind of highlight some of the features and and, and ideologies behind uh, building these sorts of front front end APIs on top of friends and how we can then actually start managing the uh, different users and, and and monitor everyone who is who is doing uh, doing what on top of our APIs and basically try and have an overview on on what should I kind of actually uh, design for what should I take into account when I'm when I want to create a front-end application uh, using friends and using the APIs that that friends can publish uh, how the architecture should be set up and basically try and get you get you kick-started on your way uh, of actually creating these sorts of applications on top of the the APIs that that, that friends have has uh, before we get to the actual nits and bits here of, of what we're actually, uh, or, or in the demo section of actually going through what 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 the API should be looking like and, and what we're kind of like want to configure in friends and, and how that's linking to the linking to the actual front end application. I wanted to have a kind of a quick reminder on the actual functionalities and features of friends. So uh, you, as you probably know, and if you don't know, you should probably go and check out our other other webinars straight away uh, on the kind of more architectural approach uh, of the of the friends agent agent installation and how we're handling everything uh, from the kind of architectural point of view. But you probably remember uh, from the previous previous uh, webinars that we have this sort of a three layered approach into API management and, and exposing APIs in general in, in friends where each of the agents that we have installed in, in our environment with, within friends has the capability of actually delivering all of the API gateway functionalities. So you have the option of actually choosing where do you want to expose the APIs, be it from an on-premise endpoint or in a cloud endpoint or any combination of the of the two. But the interesting bit or the important bit here is to kind of understand that there are now the kind of different layers that we have going on here. So of course the, the first layer is, is the actual kind of consumer applications that are using our APIs to deliver some sort of functionality to either an automated automated software or a front-end application like a web app built with using a JavaScript framework uh, such as for example Vue.js that we are going to be we're going to be using today to actually connect towards our APIs and then the whole friends layer and where the ideology of of course that right now we have this sort of a two-way binding if you please between the web application and then any of the data sources or, or functionalities that we might have on the on the bottom layer there and of course why are we doing doing something like this why are we using friends to now actually kind of uh, isolate the consumer layer of the apis from the backend layer of the of, of the services and, and data and functionalities is is fairly straightforward so the whole ideology is of course that now we can have a way to manage and view and monitor all the traffic that's coming to, towards our, our application or from our applications and our, our API consumers and have the understand the understanding of the kind of analytical side of things that uh, who is using what API in how many uh, or in what context and, and, and is there something that, that we should actually be uh, worried about so we have the option of actually uh, looking going through the audit trail and seeing uh, 
if I consumed some data from an application or service uh, using the kind of middle layer in friends now of course provides us with the option of finding finding that 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 API call and kind of tracking it through the whole infrastructure to see where the API call actually ended up and where the data uh, data data that we actually returned to the front end system uh, came from but of course the, the the second point is more or more I would say kind of like an architectural decision to have this sort of a loosely coupled uh, ideology between the consuming end of the application and then the backend service or the or the data source that we have there uh, have there uh, because of course now yeah the development processes that we are using with modern kind of front-end development frameworks and even many of these sorts of low-code or, or no-code front-end application development systems uh, are built within these sort of or are, are built uh, with these certain types of architectures in mind and most of the time uh, those architectures are actually uh, built heavily on top of existing standards such as for example the open API specification or previously known as Swagger or GraphQL and, and things like that that really help the front-end developer kind of uh, work faster and at work more smart and, and, and kind of like a, have a better understanding of, of how they are interacting with the, with the front-end services uh, and the back-end services or the back-end data sources there. So that's why we're trying to kind of keep in line and actually try and be kind of as up to speed on the kind of modern front-end development frameworks uh, as well to be able to provide this sort of an ease of use experience to the developer who's actually now uh, creating or designing the the actual front-end application that we're going to be we're going to be using there and decoupling that kind of ease of use or that that nice developer experience we can offer to the front-end developer from the kind of uh, I would say a rather tricky or not necessarily tricky the integrations can be quite simple as well but decouple that 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 nice developer experience from the 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 kind of problems or different i would say skill sets that you need in order to then actually get the data and and harmonize the data in a way that you can then provide this sort of a nice developer experience for the front end developer and that's what we're, where we're using friends uh, mainly for today's purposes is to kind of demonstrate this ideology that that if we actually develop our api in a nice and nice manner and we follow the best practices uh, we can kind of hide away uh, some of the crappiness a little bit even in the in the backend data sources or or, or functionalities that we want to have for for our front end application or our web 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 or mobile application in the in the front front end world there and basically what it kind of boils down to is pretty much i would say this picture here so we've previously taken a look at the kind of lahitaxi reference case architecture here uh, also but to maybe further kind of elaborate on this this sort of architectural approach here a little bit before we go into the actual actual concrete demo there uh, no matter what kind of a front-end framework you're choosing to use there or what sort of a uh, front-end application you're building so you could do this completely by hand but with nothing but let's say php or uh, you could use drupal or or whatever or you could be using a client-side library like react or vue.js or even a native native mobile application or a low-code developer platform, such as, for example, like a Microsoft Power Apps or Mendix or AppGyver. All of these kind of frameworks and, and, and developer, I would say, IDEs that the front-end developers are going to be using uh, have native toolkits to actually hook up directly into the kind of well-defined APIs that we want to be publishing from friends and there's a there's a really kind of a, a whole bunch of steps that you can skip when doing the front-end development if you have this sort of a well-defined API that you can now actually plug plug straight into in friends and we'll take a look at it uh, look at that and see how that kind of interacts with the whole big picture because there's even toolkits uh, around that if you have a well-defined API using, for example, open API specification, you can even create these sort of sample applications or 
SDKs that are customized to your API that you're publishing. And that's the main reason that we want to be uh, focusing and using, the, using that sort of an open API specification uh, approach or language there to basically communicate with the front-end developer and the frameworks and tools that the front-end developer is using uh, as well as we possibly can. And, and of course, the kind of like a, one of the other key issues here is to, in order for us to achieve this sort of a nice developer experience for our front-end developer, means that we should now, when creating and designing these APIs and, and, and kind of working together with the front-end team, for example, we should take the approach that uh, we are developing the API uh, not from the kind of backend systems perspective, so not from the data perspective or the kind of system architecture perspective of, of where we are actually hosting our systems here and that, that are providing the data and the functionality for our API, but rather from the perspective of the consuming application. And like I talked a little bit about previously, this usually uh, results in the fact that there is a conflict uh, between the kind of ways and, 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 and structures and, and, and even the kind of flow of the data uh, be, from the format and the kind of ideology that the front-end application would like to use the, the, the data sources as efficiently as possible as compared to the, the backend systems or the, the backend services, which might be designed from a completely different perspective than to be used in these sorts of uh, these sorts of front end scenarios. And that's, of course, where then the kind of integration and I would say orchestration and kind of composition uh, capabilities of friends come into play. Uh, meaning that now with friends, we can, of course, uh, kind of expose the API just as we like to we like it to be. So we can do that uh, together with the front end team and kind of from the perspective of the front end, the front end team and then use the orchestration features of friends to uh, uh, provide the same functionality and the same data sources uh, from the backend system to the front-end application in the format that the front-end application and the, the kind of front-end team usually uh, actually really likes or desires because of course they want to make their their job as easy and, 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 and fun and, 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 and fast as possible. So of course we want to facilitate that with friends and that usually means that now we might have to call multiple different data sources uh, at the same time. So from a practical perspective, what this means is that uh, if we have here, for example, in the, in the Lahi taxi, taxi case that we've looked at previously, we have the order taxi <clears throat> endpoint here. <clears throat> so, uh, and the order taxi endpoint or, or actually ordering the taxi requires you to actually interact with multiple different systems and services. So you might have to go through a payment service there. You might have to use the customer information located in a CRM system. And then of course you need to create the actual ta taxi order in an ERP system. But we don't want to kind of force this uh, logic and this kind of a specific way of consuming data from the backend systems or the backend services onto the developer here in the, for the mobile application. But we want to kind of obfuscate and, and, and even kind of abstract that a, li a little bit away. So we just have a simple call or order, order taxi API. And within friends, within the orchestration, we are now managing the kind of automation. So in which order do we, do we actually need to create the different calls to the different systems? And uh, how do we kind of ensure the, the, the transactionality of, of ordering the API? So making sure that if, for, for example, the payment for a taxi ride fails, we don't then continue along with the other, other API calls. And we can create this sort of a logical layer that now isolates the consumer or the front-end developer from the backend services. Uh, and that's of course for the benefit, benefit of the front-end front -end developer, but also this allows us as the kind of owner of the, the business process or owner of the data to kind of enforce our control uh, for the front-end developers. So meaning that if we want, want to have 
uh, create these sort of, let's say, orders or get the data and combine the data from various different data sources or limit access using uh, authorities and or, or authentication and authorization, we can now force that for the front-end developer without that front-end developer actually have to, having to kind of worry about that at, at all or even take that into account since that's being described by our uh, nice and standardized API description, but also uh, we can now kind of uh, force that onto the developer by basically just creating the API in a specific way and, 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 and adding these sorts of, for example, business logic checks there that, that should the API consumer be allowed to do this and this, or uh, should these combination of data be allowed for this and this type of consumer. And, and these are really, the, I would say, the, the key architectural kind of benefits and ideologies behind uh, the sort of front end to, to friends uh, use cases where the, the main benefits would, would, would probably become or come in the form that for the front end developer, it's much less work to use an API where friends is actually kind of orchestrating and abstracting away uh, the kind of I would say crappiness of the backend system or the complicatedness of the backend system or services. Uh, but also now from the backend systems perspective, we can kind of make everything as standardized as possible and, and, and also kind of have that visibility of, of tracking the data from the front end application to the backend services in the context of, of, of the front end application. So rather than having to use this sort of a traditional, I would say, API management approach where the front-end application would directly call all the different services that, and, and back-end systems that we are exposing there. And then it's up to the kind of front-end application to decide the logic that and, uh, and the order in which we want to consume these APIs. Now we can actually monitor and, and even look at the analytics from the front-end application's perspective, but still have the ability to actually go and look at the look at the backend systems and services uh, from their perspective as well using the the kind of mini service or the sub process ideology within within friends but i guess that could be probably enough for now for the kind of architectural approach and the reasoning behind why we are doing something like this in friends and why we would be doing something like this in friends and time to actually go ahead and look at a couple of different use cases and examples here from a friend's perspective. So the first thing that, that I'm going to be showing, showing to you guys is uh, an, an easy example that, that we've now built using, using, using Vue.js, like I discussed, which is basically uh, just displaying the data of our insurance API here and providing, of course, authentication towards that towards that API and, and what sort of design considerations we should, be, uh, we should be taking into account when developing these APIs and, and, and how we've actually now kind of manifested these in the, in the real world here within, within our example. So if first we kind of like take a, just take a quick peek at the APIs uh, themselves before going into the actual, actual front, end, front end portion as well, uh, I recommend you take a look at the other webinar that we have about legacy modernization, because that's describing in detail uh, how we are now actually modernizing uh, access to basically uh, a legacy insurance database and creating uh, basically a, a modernized version of, of access towards that insurance database and towards those insurance data, uh, data endpoints. But our use case here is, of course, today to just take this insurance API, and I reiterate that go go take a look at the the other webinar we have to for more information about how we actually now implemented the the the, the backend APIs and the access to the insurance APIs there. But the key point or, or the key key benefit here that 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 we have have to go through before looking at the uh, actual. Uh, application and or the actual front-end development side of things is this sort of a, a restful approach to APIs in general. So because we are using, of course, open API specification, 
here within friends to describe our API and we won't go into that much detail here on how the description language works since we have other webinars and other guides uh, about that but the basic principle behind these sort of restful APIs is that you should always try and have kind of follow the, the guidelines of the of the open API specification <clears throat> as much as possible and and some of these guidelines are kind of less important so those as examples of those less important guidelines might be that you always describe your data uh, with examples and with formats and make that as kind of as, as beautiful and pretty as as possible and of course that's that's a really nice thing to have and that really helps along as as well for the front-end developer but the main uh, kind of principle when designing these apis uh, from the kind of front-end perspective is that you want to have a kind of multiple different layers of accessing the data. So rather than have an API that returns everything about all of our insurances in a single kind of a data, data dump even to the front end system, we have to take into account or we should take into account that uh, we might have a lot of traffic on our APIs here. So that means that our APIs need to be designed to be kind of af as performant as possible. And the best way to actually uh, get performance or, or kind of like design with pre performance principles is try and split up the different uh, kind of API use cases into as small pieces as possible. So uh, as a nice real life example of this, uh, I, if I want to kind of now browse through and access insurance data, uh, rather than, like I said, rather than have all of our insurances in this one huge JSON data dump, we want to have first a list of insurances that we can display some information for the user. And usually these sorts of kind of, I would say API design principles uh, really go hand in hand with the uh, kind of design or, or I would say even like a service modeling or, or service design uh, phase of, of whatever you're trying to build on the, on the front end side of things. Since for example, if we are now creating a design for an application where we first have a list of, of items that we might kind of search through or we might display that with kind of a little bit less information than we have have available for the whole object, uh, that design usually uh, mirrors the API design as well, almost one-to-one, -one, but not in all cases, of course. But from our perspective, what we of course wanna do here is have this ideology available that first we get a list of, of insurances where we can display some information for the user. And then when the user is interested, in, in kind of further information about that insurance, then we can kind of have a separate API that then the front end will of course call when he or she needs that data or needs that, that, that that's insurance specifics. Uh, another way to look at this from kind of a design principle or design perspective as well, is that uh, we want to minimize the amount of data in, in purely just in measured in, in, in bytes or, or bits. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of data that we are transferring between friends and then the consuming application. So this is a really good kind of rule of thumb or a design guideline or a best practice to think about how our APIs will be used and how we can minimize just the number of bits being transferred between the front end application and of course then, then friends or the, the API. And of course, what we are doing here really kind of fits into that kind of minimizing the amount of, of traffic ideology as well. Since uh, if we were to send all of our insurance data in one just huge, huge chunk or, or, or kind of like a, 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 a batch of, of, or the list of all the insurances with all their data, uh, that would mean that all, in, all the insurances have now multiple rows of, of, of multiple values of the data there. But now because we are kind of just providing the bare bone minimum uh, set of data for the list, so in this case, it would be the value of the insurance and the, the ID of the insurance we're using. Uh, 
and then providing the kind of further information about the kind of more specifics of the of the of the of the insurance in question this means that from kind of a big picture perspective we're of course getting uh, a lot of hits for the for our list so basically every time a user uses our application or our api they need to go through the list so they need to first call the insurance list api because otherwise they won't have the information uh, available to, to kind of see which insurance I should be actually connecting towards or, or which insurance information I should be calling from. Uh, but then again, from another perspective, we are kind of making up for those extra calls that everyone has to make for our list API here by only providing the information about those insurances that uh, we are interested in or we know that we need the information. From the, from the front end's perspective. So in the big picture of things, even though taking this approach might mean more calls to the list API, it's still much more performant and much more uh, kind of like a, a network friendly. So we are transferring less bits in total per user uh, by splitting up the data between these sorts of APIs. And and of course, this, this the design kind of philosophy or, or best practice can be uh, adapted even further. So if we were to have, let's say, uh, a customer object or uh, an insurance, so if you're looking at insurance policies here, we might now have a kind of more information or more, more details uh, about the kind of uh, uh, target of our insurance. So for example, the house, where the house, lo house is located, is there a loan on the house, and so on, and so on, and so on. So actually the insurance kind of details from the insurance lists could actually now have our third API, which could be then dash, for example, uh, policy details or something along those lines, where we have kind of like a third layer in our hierarchy. And, and like I said, these usually are pretty one-to-one -one with the use cases that, that the design and, and especially service design with the fire wireframes and so, uh, comes up with, and then we'll just can we can just take those and and implement them as is there directly here into friends. But from our use case, so what do we actually want to kind of go through here now is basically take a look at an example application that that I've created for us. And just to actually be 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 transparent here, uh, uh, this is something that actually one of our customers created uh, from a little bit of a different use perspective, which I basically just stole and and adapted to to our use case here. But pretty much what what our application here is doing, it's a single HTML standalone application, no server side rendering or no nothing of the of the like there uh, whatsoever. Uh, and of course, I, I realize this isn't the correct way to actually utilize Boe.js and, 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 and keep that in mind. But basically what our application uh, does and our applica application is, is a simple way for us to browse through our insurance API here. So enable basically a user to uh, display and render the information behind our insurance API and display it in our now nice now a web view. So we can actually take a look at a couple of different things that we have to take into account when designing these sorts of front end uh, integrations or front end layers between friends and the, the consuming applications. And, and of course, uh, how we have to kind of take, into, they take those into account in, in real life and in, in practice. But basically, uh, the way that that our API or our front-end application works is that is that it's simply doing uh, a couple of calls. So the first call our, our our application is doing is to the actual insurance list here whenever the application is now actually being loaded. And we can now of course simulate this or, or look at this from the kind of uh, directly from the friend's UI's perspective as well. So if we navigate to our uh, our insurance data API we have available here, and well, let me actually close these other ones here so we don't get we don't get sidetracked. Uh, and of course, we could kind of now go ahead and try, but we see that we don't have an API key since, of course, I've now defined uh, my API here that there needs to be API key authentication in order for for me to access 
my API. So that means that then we need to go in and actually create our new API key. So actually, let me delete this, the existing key and the existing API rule set here uh, from, from friends so we can actually start from scratch. So let's call our, our new API key Osmos um, Insurance API key just for just for clarity's sake. And let's not set any request limits or, or anything else. And we'll say that, that, yeah, we are perfectly happy for this API key to exist in the development environment. So let's save our API key and we have our API key here available. So the first step or the next step would be to authorize ourselves and now try and access the API. But now we're of course getting the error that our API key is not valid because we haven't set an API rule set to allow that specific API key access to the API that we wanna actually consume here. So I'll just add a new API key rule set here and call this uh, I'll allow access to insurance API. And I'll add a new rule saying that I wanna act, I want to allow HTTP get methods and I want to allow them for our insurance data API. So I, I mean, that, and what this means is that basically uh, anything under this API here, so everything that's being listed here is now, uh, and any, everything that's uh, more specifically a get method for the API is something that, that we are allowing. And uh, uh, finally, of course, what I wanna say is that I want to apply this rule set for the API key as most insurance API key. So if I go ahead and save changes, now we should have our nicely generated API key here, which I actually should be able to now use and authorize myself to the APIs, no problem. Great, so that means that now we have our list of, 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 of our APIs or our insurances where basically we have our policy ID and our insurance value and, and so on and so on available for us uh, from, the, from the API to call. And how this actually translates to our app is that we are using exactly the same methodology here where we're basically just adding the X API key uh, and getting that from an element that that's that's the input for our API key. So this element here. So if I, if I actually try and kind of uh, load our insurances here without my API key, I'll just get a 401 error and basically be be stuck there forever. But uh, because I haven't I haven't implemented error handling in the way that it's I'm supposed to. But with the API key there, what we can now actually do is click the load insurances button. And basically what we are doing in our front end application here is something super, super, super simple. So we are just rendering a table row where we're getting the insurance policy ID and the insurance value from the API call. So from the insurances API call that, that we're using here. And the kind of more clever or, or more alert <laughs> of, of you might actually notice something quite familiar here. So you are probably noticing the kind of double handle handlebars notation that, that we are, or, or I'm using here in my, in my Voida.js application. And this looks super similar to what we're doing in Friends, of course, as well. And one of the kind of key reasons that we are kind of uh, doing something similar in Friends or actually almost identical, and, and the approach here is called, called handlebars, is that we feel that this is the kind of modern way of not only building, of course, kind of front-end uh, websites or applications, but if you take the approach that uh, actually building a JSON document or an XML document or a flat file document is exactly the same as building a, basically a website and the complexity levels of building a website or building a complicated, let's say, insurance message are usually pretty much the same. And we've taken huge inspiration in Friends from the front-end development world of, of actually using these sorts of similar ideologies in, in actually defining and mapping messages between different formats. But getting back to our demo here, so the, the, uh, what we're doing there is fairly simple. It's just taking the values of the policy ID and the insurance value from our API 
and rendering a multiple different table rows here for each of the different different instances that our, our API is returning. And also saying that uh, each of the rows should be clickable. So I'm saying that, that, that this particular insurance row should be something that uh, if you click them, we want to get the insurance details. And what we're doing there is quite simply just calling the next step in our API. So whenever I'm clicking any of the insurance table rows, uh, we are doing exactly what I'm doing here manually. So if we imagine this to be our insurance row, we are just simply taking the policy ID and applying it for our next API call to get the specific information about uh, that specific insurance here. And this is what it kind of like means in real life or in practice to build these sort of layered or hierarchic, hierarchical rest, restful APIs where you have these sort of multiple depths into which you can go into the insurance data. So we have, of course, the list and now we have the specific information. And I could continue this along like we discussed for more and more and more features for more and more and more uh, information and details uh, about that particular data, set of data. And a really important thing to kind of understand here from an architectural and, and a design point of view as well is that now if we imagine that we have our application here and we've now rendered our list of insurances nicely and we can click on a specific insurance and get the details for that particular insurance here and, and all looks nice and nice and dandy and, and fine and we're perfectly happy happy with those those insurance details uh, now if we imagine that that all right uh, we have our application done it's finished it's, it's published but we need to add a new feature for for example uh, showing that insurances details on the map using longitude or latitude or showing an overall overview overview of let's say all insurances in the state of Florida, I guess it's, it's our, our, our dummy data here. Uh, but that means that using this sort of a same RESTful API design principle, I don't now have to go in and break my existing API. So I don't have to go in and add new fields here saying uh, that the state of Florida in general or in, on average has this and this information. So I'll leave my existing API as it is, and now simply kind of uh, add a dash and add a new API or, or on top of there, or even add a completely different uh, API path here to, for example, get uh, kind of a summary by state code. So this means that, that, that if we need to create these sort of new features or new functionalities to supplement our existing application, uh, if we are following the RESTful design principles correctly, that means that we almost never have to actually go in and, and literally change the content or change the behavior of an existing API. Although those situations can occur, but those are much more rare if we are following the RESTful design principles uh, as well as we can actually, or as well as we possibly, possibly ban, can, because we can always just keep on adding new resources, new paths, to our APIs to fulfill that functionality of the of the of the new front end requirement, and this also kind of now a little bit circles back to the uh, the best practice or the principle of transferring as little data as possible. Because now, if we've come to the design decision that this is the kind of minimum amount of data that we can actually work with within our API uh, here in 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 this case, uh, what this means from a from the application's perspective also is that we shouldn't now add any extra processing or add anything extra to our existing data, but rather have it as a completely separate API. Uh, and exactly for the same reason that we are splitting the API list and the details of a specific API in the first place. So this of course now kind of follows along that, that path of, of thinking and, and reasoning in exactly the same way. Uh, but a couple of different things that, that we also have to take into account here when creating these sorts of APIs and these sorts of uh, integrations between friends and, and different front-end front -end applications. Uh, one thing that we really have to pay, pay close attention to 
uh, is naming conventions and the data formats that we are returning data uh, to our application. And what do we mean by this? So, for example, uh, if we look at some of the data formats that we have available here, so for example, we have our insurance value here uh, set for, I would, I would believe these are for, for dollar uses and they appear to be just a, a, a dollar value of, of that insurance in, in total. But, but uh, and you see here that we basically are displaying the raw value and displaying it in a, a string format here on our, on our API. And you might be tempted uh, to create your API in a way that you, for example, return these as, as euro values. So you might actually, or dollar values. So rather than just provide the pure number, you might be tempted to add, let's say a dollar sign there or a euro sign there uh, on the, on the, at the end of the, of the value there. But if we now kind of think of this from the front end's perspective uh, a little bit as well, uh, what this or what that would actually mean or what that would that would end up happening is that we are kind of now taking something that's a number and making it basically not a number from the front end perspective. So we are we are making uh, the front end do extra work in order to process this value as a number if we are adding anything to it that isn't a part of the the actual raw data itself. And from the front end perspective, of course, now if I wanted to go ahead and add, let's say, uh, the, the dollar or euro sign there for our insurance value or do any sort of processing or extra processing for the, for the data, that would mean that, of course, now because I have access to the raw data or the raw value there, I could just basically go in here and, and, and add the dollar sign, or actually, I think I need to do it, do it like that. So add the dollar sign there to our table row. And now if we refresh our page, and well, I guess we have to get, get our API key again. So like so, and load our insurances. Now we have our dollar value there or the similar or something similar where we could of course now just add the Euro sign there on the, on the end of the <laughs> end of the data. So exactly the same ideology where what we wanna be doing is passing data uh, to the front end uh, in the format that the front end is uh, equipped to handle or equipped to deal with. Because now, for example, because we have the raw data for the insurance value from our API, uh, if we are now, for example, dealing with a, an application or a front end system that needs to have localization, so we would need to have users from the from the EU and the, the the United States and and wherever now using that kind of local or, or, or raw data value it's quite easy for us to for example convert our insurance value to another currency and then just add the currency sign that our user is interested in so our APIs that we are creating and developing for the front end should always be kind of as agnostic about the end user itself as possible and just kind of try and bring as well structured and as, as well kind of anonymized data to the front end as possible. So we should never try and create an API where we are kind of uh, customizing the content or the uh, formatting or the hierarchy of the data uh, based on the user's privileges or, or, or based on the user's preferences. And that should all be left to be done in the front end. And our API should be just returning data in as nice a format or as nicely structured as we, as we possibly can. One exception to this rule is of course, from an authorization perspective. So uh, a good design principle or, or good design thinking here might be that we could have, let's say, an extra value here called the point granularity, and it's the value is, for example, one here. And this might be not information aimed uh, for the end user itself, but this information might be kind of uh, metadata information that we want to actually now provide for the front end application displaying that information for the user. So what does that what does that mean that we are not then customizing our API or 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 uh, 
kind of uh, making that something that the that that we are kind of taking the end user into account but we are taking into account that the developer who is creating the experience for the for the front end uh, for for the end user uh, might have to take some of this extra data which has no real life uh, connection or no real life value to the end user but he or she might want to build a logic or something here uh, some logic in the in the in the application itself saying that if for example the point granularity is one then I want to have my values in uh, displayed in tens of thousands rather than the uh, default value that we have here but we are still leaving the kind of front end to take care of that transformation but we are kind of providing these flags and this kind of metadata for the front end application and for the front end developer and that's completely fine uh, because then that's not something that that will be uh, usually directly be directly displayed to the to the end user and not something that the end user is even kind of interested in 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 our use case here so that's something that uh, or something to really keep in mind when when designing and and creating uh, creating these apis and of course from a from another perspective we have or what we are doing here if that if we now jump back here into uh, the kind of friend side of things we can of course see here that, that here we have our uh, our requests now for our insurance details that we are kind of gathering here when we are clicking through our uh, our insurance demo, and of course we can see them uh, correlate and line up in our friends monitoring view, and we'll, let, we'll not go that much into detail into how we are now actually kind of uh, looking through each insurance and so on. Uh, but an another really nice design principle now uh, from friends perspective is that because we are now using this sort of, or we know that we are creating an API uh, for a front-end application. And, and another thing that I should, I should mention here, uh, because we didn't kind of have, go through this earlier, is that if we are creating APIs for, let's say, business-to-business uh, -business applications or business-to-business -business use cases, where the consumer of the API uh, is not an application, but a server somewhere, or we are aiming this to be, for example, an order API, uh, then we can kind of take much more liberties and, and kind of uh, adapt our API to the business use case uh, without that much or without any kind of negative side effects. And, and everything that we've been going through here today is, is purely aimed when we're creating, uh, creating integrations and, and APIs for, for front-end applications, so, so mobile apps, uh, web apps, uh, low-code applications, and so on and so on. So something that has, an, has a direct end user uh, to access our data. But especially in, in, in these sorts of API cases, uh, a really good kind of a best practice when, when developing friends is actually taking a look at all of the APIs. So for example, we now have the insurance list and then we have the get the specific insurance, which now of course correlates what we are clicking here. But in order for me to now actually monitor this in a reasonable way, so that then we actually can have that sort of, a, I would say backlog of, the, of, of what the user, so what I as the API consumer have been up to, uh, I should, actually develop my API backends in a way that I implement the promoting of the variable that the user is actually calling to the monitoring perspective. So uh, in our previous webinars and of course in our documentation, there's a whole bunch of extra information about, uh, about what does the promote result as mean. But what we should be doing is that we should be actually promoting the same variables that are being used to create the hierarchy within our API. So in our case, it should be the insurance ID because that's something that's in, that we've designed in our API parameter or API path to actually contain and say that we want to actually now get the, the, the specific insurances uh, policy ID here and promote that uh, as, as, as our as our value or variable. So what I'm actually going to be doing is just taking the insurance and taking the 
insurance or actually was it called policy ID? I think it, I think it was called policy ID. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and promote that as the same name as our path variable here for our insurance insurance ID as well. And I'll just call this insurance ID as well. Save our changes because now when we implement the uh, promoted variable from the monitoring perspective, uh, what does that actually enable us to do? So let's get rid of some of the more more useless information I would guess in, in that case is that of course we don't have that available now for the previous instances but now if we actually go we go ahead and go in here again and load our insurances and now when we start kind of viewing specific insurance details here so checking what does ins each insurance actually a, a bit of a usability problem here because now <laughs> the list doesn't follow with me but, but never mind that. But now that we're clicking through our insurances and, and, and seeing a whole bunch of different insurance data, and if we now go ahead and view of, uh, from our monitoring perspective, view the data, it's super nice that now we can actually have that insurance ID that we are actually retrieving for the front end for our monitoring. And we can even see, and we can now see the who's using that insurance uh, and who's actually calling that. So now it's super easy for us to actually uh, find out that if I'm now a user and I click this and it's the 188150 and for some reason something goes wrong or the, I as a user think that my data isn't correct or whatever. Uh, now from the friend's perspective, it's quite easy for us to actually come in here and find the executions which match what the user was actually calling from the from the API perspective and jump in here and see what's actually happening so where where was our where was our insurance data what were we doing uh, how did we get our data from the uh, from the backend system and so on and so on and so on and have that capability of now actually uh, debugging pretty much what's happening on the front end and where does the front end data come from if we do that kind of matching of the of the insurance ID to what we're actually creating and, and building here on the on the front end as well. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, but a couple of things that I still wanted to go through, I, I took way too long to just, uh, talk about some of the uh, architectural stuff or the best practices or guidelines. Uh, but one really key thing here uh, to think about uh, naming conventions uh, when we're creating these sort of front end, these sorts of front end APIs. So I actually have uh, three different uh, naming conventions applied here for our, our API. So I have what's called uh, kind of like a camel case. And then I have kind of all uh, kind of uh, lowercase letters, and then I have what's called the underscore separation. And basically, we have two right options and uh, one incorrect option. And uh, you probably might be able to guess which is the incorrect option here, but I'll explain it anyway. So when we are creating kind of our uh, property names and creating our APIs, and this also applies, of course, to XML as well, uh, even though you should avoid um, providing XML, XML uh, services to, to modern front-end frameworks since all the modern front-end frameworks uh, want to be working with, with JSON data. Uh, but a really good idea, the idea that we, or what we should be applying is that we should always uh, have our property names in either a capital case, so meaning that this, should, this policy ID should be something like this, or in camel case, like we are doing here, where we are separating each new new word with a capital letter, or then have everything in just uh, all lowercase letters. Because if we are doing something like separating the property names, or the worst case scenario that you could be doing is something like this, that you could be naming your API uh, by basically adding in a blank spaces between the property names uh, or adding, for example, as or is or, or Swedish os or anything that's not kind of the part of the, I would say, standard, I would say, uniform English 
anymore. It, it, they are part of UTF-8, but we should avoid using any special characters uh, if, if at all uh, possible. And the reason that we want to be naming our properties and creating our hierarchies in, in this manner uh, is that a lot of front-end development frameworks are now using the same ideology that we're using in friends to actually access the data. So what this means is that if my policy ID, for some reason I had named my policy ID instead of doing it like that, I had created it, I had created it something like this. That would mean that now in the kind of front-end development framework, and this applies to React, Web, and, and almost all, all of these kind of declarative uh, frameworks that, that, that we're using, using nowadays. Uh, that means that I'm not now able to actual po policy ID. So I can't do something like this because now the framework won't be able to evaluate uh, this policy ID properly because the kind of space or the empty space there has an actual meaning. So it has a different meaning than what we are doing here in our API. So we should make sure that all of our API properties uh, are a single kind of like a extra characterless, empty spaceless word, because then we can uh, allow the front end developer to now access the data and do what whatever he wants, uh, he or she wants with our data without having to do any sort of a mapping or this sort of a, a kind of like data transformation uh, for the front end. And, and if you uh, basically end up in a situation that you have a badly formed API, that you, for example, have an ad there, and for example, vue.js doesn't know how to parse a in these sort of property names, you are now creating a lot of extra work for the front end developer. So trying to keep it for as simple and kind of as compatible as possible from the front end developer's perspective is, is really the key in, in everything that, that we are doing here. And of course now uh, we didn't really uh, go through a lot of the kind of uh, authorization or authentication options here, but of course a correct way to do this, for example, access to my API here, I now used API keys, but in, in real life scenarios or real life situations, uh, I would most likely be much better off creating an, an open ID connect and OAuth to uh, compatible uh, identity provider and securing access uh, to my API through there and uh, actually managing, managing our open ID applications here in Friends and, and limiting access and authentication and authorization through that rather than API keys. But we do have our other seminars and other documentation about, about that as well. So how, how I can be using my API uh, or secure my APIs using OpenID Connect and, and OAuth 2 instead of uh, API keys like we, we did here in our, our example. But all right, so we're almost out of time. One minute le remaining. Uh, hopefully this had been has been uh, at least somewhat interesting and we did focus a little bit about a little bit more on the kind of architectural and best practices uh, this time around uh, but that was something that was actually hoped or or, or, or or something that were requested by the the uh, webinar webinar consumers last time and this is uh, has been our final webinar of the year so we managed to get a total of, of, of nine webinars going going this uh, this year and we'll of course plan on keeping keeping on keeping on or plan on keeping this this up for the next year as well so just with uh, or, or thank you for the for the previous year and we hope to, that you you join us for the next one in january which then the subject which i actually can't remember right now but uh be sure to kind of look for our our future webinars uh, coming in 2020 uh, about some of the same sub stuff and subjects and mostly about new fun functions and features and, 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 and functionality that we have coming over in, in 2020. But thank you everyone for, for, for this, this uh, intro into the front-end development world and, and friends and have a great Christmas and a, and a happy new year and thanks for the uh, 2019 with, with all of you. All right. <laughs>
Thank you. Bye-bye.